Genetics is a fascinating topic and genealogy has brought genetics to the masses. Down syndrome is a genetic disorder that we have known about for about 150 years when an English physician named John Langdon Downs first described it. Now with current genetic genealogy, are we able to see what Down syndrome looks like on a chromosome level? Howdy, I'm Andy Lee with Family History Fanatics and this is a segment of DNA. Be sure to subscribe to our channel and click on the bell if you'd like to be notified about upcoming episodes. Down syndrome is a genetic disorder that is a type of trisomy. Trisomy disorders are defined by having three copies of a particular chromosome rather than two copies of a particular chromosome. For Down syndrome, that is on chromosome number 21. There are also other trisomy disorders that affect other chromosomes, but Down syndrome is probably the most common. It occurs in about one out of every 1,000 pregnancies, but it's more common in pregnant women over 40. Basically what has happened is when the egg and the sperm are formed, rather than getting one copy of chromosome number 21, that egg or sperm actually gets two copies of chromosome number 21. And so when they combine together, you end up having three copies of chromosome number 21. While I was at Roots Tech, one of the attendees of my class asked me whether or not you would see Down syndrome on a genetic genealogy test. Now I thought about this and I really didn't have an answer at the time. So I reached out to some of my contacts at the different DNA companies to see what they had to say. And what they told me led me to believe that there's a couple of ways that this might show up on a genetic genealogy test. To understand what you would see with a trisomy disorder, you need to understand a little bit about how your DNA is processed. Typically we each have two chromosomes, one from our mother and one from our father. The microarray chip isolates specific segments of that DNA along each one of the chromosomes. Next, a computer is going to read what the letters are for that specific location. So let me give you a visual representation of what this is sort of like. On this microarray chip, there are 700,000 spots. And each spot is sticky to a specific SNP a specific point along your DNA. When you dump a pile of DNA onto this chip, then that DNA at those specific spots are all going to stick in those specific locations. And what you end up with is you end up with a pile of letters that represent what is on that SNP on those two chromosomes. Now the computer will look at that pile and it will count up how much of each letter it sees. And usually there's only gonna be one or two letters. For instance, if you had a pile of A's and only a pile of A's, the computer's going to say that this location is AA. If your pile consists of about half A's and half C's, it's going to say that this is an AC. This is because half of your DNA or one chromosome had an A at that location and the other half of your DNA the other chromosome had a C at that location. With trisomy, you have three chromosomes. And so that pile is gonna be added up a little bit different. It's going to consist of a third will be from one chromosome, a third from the second chromosome, and a third from the third chromosome. So if that pile is made up completely of A's, again, the computer's gonna call it as AA. But if that pile is two thirds A, meaning you had an A on two of your chromosomes, and one-third C, meaning you had a C on one chromosome, then what does the computer call it? What someone with trisomy really has is they have AAC, but the computer's not set up to read AAC. It's only set up to read two letters because in 99.995% of all cases, there's only two chromosomes, and that's what it's looking for. So at this point, two things can happen depending on how each of the companies analyzes and programs that analysis. One way to analyze this is to label it a no call, meaning that no letters are reported. If you look at your own raw DNA file, you will actually see no calls and they're denoted by a dash dash or a question mark or a zero zero. And this means that the computer in that specific location just couldn't determine what letters were there. It happens on less than 2% of all of the SNPs that are analyzed. So it's not necessarily very common. 
And really, for most situations, this just means there wasn't enough DNA stuck on that spot to really determine what the letters were. Now, the other way to look at trisomy is to actually randomly grab any two of the three letters present. So an AAC would be labeled as AA one third of the time and AC two thirds of the time. I have not seen a DNA kit for somebody with Down syndrome. So I decided I was going to create one myself. I started with my ancestry DNA kit as my baseline. And for chromosomes number one through 20 and for chromosome number 22, I didn't do anything because those are gonna stay the exact same. For chromosome number 21, I needed data from my parents. And so I actually had to use their DNA kits to figure out what my chromosome number 21 would look like with trisomy. So I lined up both of my parents' DNA kits and I lined up my DNA kit. Now, whenever my parents both had the exact same call, so for instance, they both had AA or they both had CC or GG or TT, then I was going to inherit AA, GG, CC, or TT. And so even with trisomy, even with three chromosomes in that location, it's always gonna grab two of the same letters. Next, I had to choose which one of my parents was going to give me two chromosomes. And in this case, I just chose my dad. So using what I knew about my dad's DNA and my mom's DNA and my DNA, I had to separate out or I had to phase my DNA to figure out which half I got from my mom and which half I got from my dad. Now I was able to figure out just from the differences about 95% of all the DNA, which I got from my mom, and which I got from my dad. And for the last 300 SNPs, what it was is I had a call of AC and each one of my parents also had a call of AC or AT or something like that, where it wasn't apparent which of those letters I got from which parent. So in this case, I just had to assume which was the one for my dad and which one was the one for my mom. But again, this only affected 5% of my overall DNA. So from this, I have three columns of SNPs. I have two from my dad and I have one from my mom. Then I went through and I randomly grabbed two of any of those three SNPs on each location to determine what my overall trisomy chromosome number 21 would look like. For the SNPs that had three of the same letter, this basically resulted in no change from what I previously had. But for the SNPs that had one letter difference, what this meant is that I had about a third of the time, I was actually pulling both of my fathers and I didn't have a SNP that represented my mother. The other two thirds of the time, it was my father and my mother. I then took this information and replaced chromosome number 21 on my ancestry file and uploaded it again as my trisomy random call file. For the no call method, so if all three columns have the same letter, then I was able to make a call and it was going to be two of that letter. So AAA turned into AA. If any one of those three letters was different, then I labeled that as a no call. Now, once I got through that entire chromosome, the no calls ended up being about a third of the overall chromosome. I then took this data and replaced it in my ancestry file for chromosome number 21 and uploaded that as a no call file. Now doing one-to-one -one match comparisons is interesting because we can actually see what the trisomy is going to look like with each one of these different analysis methods. And since only chromosome number 21 changed, that's the only one that I'm going to look at. So for my baseline, I'm comparing my 23andMe kit against my ancestry kit. So this is without the trisomy, so that you can see that one, it's green all the way across, meaning that it is a full match all the way across that chromosome, and it's blue all the way across, which also indicates that it is a match. Next, I compared my 23andMe kit to my trisomy no-call kit. Now, it is also all green and all blue because really all I've done is I've taken out all of those locations where there is a question. So it's only looking at those locations where it knows for sure. And because there's still enough data to call it a match, it's going to call it a match all the way across. And that's what you're going to see if the company is using the no call method of analyzing it. You're really not going to see any difference with somebody with Down syndrome on chromosome number 21 compared to the other chromosomes. So at this point, I don't need to compare that no call kit to anything else because I already know what it's going to look like all the time. And now the fun begins. 
When I look at 23andMe versus my Trisomy random call kit, I can start to see some big differences. First, the blue bar is all the way across the chromosome because I'm always pulling at least one of my father's SNPs. And so I'm going to be at least a half match across this entire chromosome. But what you'll notice is now, instead of a solid green bar on top, it's actually interspersed with a lot of this yellow, indicating that there's some cases where I don't match both of my parents because sometimes I'm pulling both of my father's SNPs rather than my father's SNP and one of my mother's SNPs. Now, because of how this is distributed randomly throughout the chromosome, there's really no place on there that I can be considered a full match. So while my other 21 chromosomes show a full match, chromosome number 21 with this random call trisomy does not show a full match. So let me take this kit and actually compare it to my father. Now the major difference between the 23andMe kit comparison and my random trisomy kit comparison is that with the 23andMe kit, you can see that I'm a half match across the entire chromosome and there is not a lot of green throughout the chromosome. But with the trisomy kit, it's still a half match across the chromosome, but there's a lot more of that green because in a lot of cases, again, I'm pulling both of my father's SNPs rather than just one of his SNPs. And when I compare it to my mother, the first thing that should jump out to you is that normally I should be a half match for my mother. But in this case, I'm not. I'm not a match at all for my mother. The other thing that you see is there's a lot of red marks on there. Each one of those red marks indicate a location where I pulled both of my father's SNPs and none of my mother's SNPs. So this is something completely different. All of my other chromosomes compared to my mom are going to be blue all the way across the bottom and mostly yellow with some green intersprinkled across the top. But with the trisomy kit, it is black across the bottom indicating it is a no match and there is a lot of red in there now. So when we look at siblings, we can see a couple of different things happen. First off, this is a sibling that I shared some half match segments with, but no fully matched segments with. With trisomy, you can see that the amount of red bars decreased and the amount of green bars increased. But overall, the red bars are now spaced evenly enough throughout that it doesn't look like I share any half matched areas. So even though that amount of red went down, because it's spread out more, those half match is now gone. Now with this other sibling, I have a fully matched segment as well as a half match segment on the chromosome. With trisomy, that fully matched segment turns into a half match segment and that half match segment is now gone. Let's compare next to my grandfather. I had a half match segment with him which disappeared with trisomy. But also we see the amount of red bars have decreased and the amount of green bars have increased. But because of the new distribution of those red bars, no segment is considered to be matching. Now with a paternal aunt, I found something a little bit different. I had two half match segments on my 23andMe file. With trisomy, one of them went away, but the other one stayed as a half match. Now I should note that this half match segment was much smaller than any of the other half match segments in my other relatives I already showed you. So in general, trisomy being analyzed as a no call is not going to affect your results at all. Trisomy being analyzed as a random call is going to affect that specific chromosome. Fully matched segments are going to turn into half matched segments. And most of your half matched segments are going to disappear unless they're really small. From an overall shared centimorgan perspective, somebody with trisomy or with Down syndrome will share less centimorgans with their close relatives, probably on the order of 10 to 50 centimorgans less. However, because these close relationships still have broad ranges, you're probably not going to see it just by looking at the amount of shared centimorgans. You're going to have to look at the chromosome browser and understand which chromosome is affected by that trisomy. Again, with Down syndrome, that is just chromosome number 21. So if you know somebody who has Down syndrome and has had a DNA test done, take a look at their chromosome comparisons with some close relatives and let me know whether or not what I have predicted on here is correct. If you have any questions about trisomy or other genetic disorders, put it in the comments below and I'll try to answer it. 
And if you like this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up and share it with your friends.